in the morning, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. So if I can have all your attention here, that would be great. How are we doing this morning? Did we just wake up? Yeah. Okay. So um, we actually have two presenters today. I'm Novia. Clayton will be arriving slightly late because of flight issues. So he will be here hopefully by 9:15. And yes. So just making sure that everyone is in the right workshop or conference, what are we in? I'm so happy, okay, perfect. Yeah, so because I do know that there are some pretty awesome workshops going on at the same time, so I just want to make sure you're in the right room, getting to know what you're trying to get to know. Okay, so a little bit about myself, I'm Novia, so I was on FRC Team 604 for three years before I graduated in 2014. And while I was on the team, I actually held many positions, and a lot of them involved project management and planning team logistics in general. And I just learned a lot. So I want to share that experience with you and just give you some little tips in case you, know, you don't know much about it or you just want to share your experiences with other people here today as well. So, yes. So we are actually from California, San Jose. Um, I don't want to say this, but do you know where 254 is from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're near there. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, uh, yes. And um, right now, I currently go to San Jose State University, and I go back, and I still mentor 604, and I also occasionally mentor Team 846, which is in the same area, and I also do workshops for uh, teams in NorCal. So. As a little bit about myself, I will let Clayton do his little speech when he gets here. So just a little heads up. Is there any questions so far? Probably not, huh? <laughs> okay, so just a quick head count. How many of you here are mentors? Wow. Okay. Um, students. Leadership. New members. Okay, that's quite a lot. What about other people? that I did not list. <laughs> what are you guys? Just yell it out. That's like not loud enough. Team members. Team members, okay. Yep, that's an important part. <laughs> Do we have any just volunteers, event volunteers? We have one. Okay, perfect. Yes, so this talk will apply to every one of you. And we actually have an activity very soon, as well as in the end of the presentation, that will involve every single one of you and your role. So enough said. Let's start. So a little bit of overview of what we will be doing today. So first, I will tell you about what project management is. Just a brief overview of what it is, and you can share some of your definitions with all of us as well. What do you think it is? And then we will go ahead and talk about how to manage yourself because that's important. And then we will also talk about how to manage your team, including setting objective for your team. Um, and then we will also talk about how to assign roles on your team so that everyone get a fair role, everyone get to do what they want to do while contributing to the team in a beneficial way. And we will also have uh, a PowerPoint slide about how to manage an event because as an FRC team or just individual in general, you will encounter a lot of opportunities where you get to organize an event and there are lots that goes into organizing an event that you might not have noticed before. So if, and quick note, if you're just filing in right now, try to fill out a table so we can have a better activity in just a few minutes. Thank you. Okay, so I do have a designated Q&A section here. However, if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to just raise your hand and we can answer it or discuss about it. Sounds good? Yes. Is the presentation going to be posted someplace? Um, yes, we could do that. Yeah. Um, I think Bruce is going to try to post it as well, but if you want, you can also talk to me afterwards, and I believe we're allowed to send it out personally. 
Okay. And then, yeah, so finally we're going to have a game activity and we will also do that in just a little bit. So what is project management? So before I give you the two examples, can someone from the audience tell me what they think project management is all about? Oh, that's really far over here. You, you just gotta say it really loud. Like, Managing a project. <laughs> okay, yes, that, that's a big part of it, yes. <laughs> Okay, did everyone hear that? Or should I? Okay. <laughs> it involves, um, it involves helping people to understand where their parts in the project are and how to get it done so it's within the given time that Yeah, that's a good one. So what about some type of flowchart or some key components in project management? What would be some of those? Timeline. Okay, timeline. Scope. Uh, anything else? Scope. Yeah. Scope. Okay. Project. Project. And there's someone raising their hand back there. Budget. Budget. Yes, that's important. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. yeah. Milestones, yeah, objective and all that, yeah, and... Number of people you got. Number of people you got, okay, so resources, yes. Priorities. Priorities, that's important, we're going to talk about that as well. Communication. Communication, oh, that's going to be a recurring theme in our presentation today, yes. Uh, organizing tasks into dependent and independent tasks. Definitely, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Uh, for example, you can't program a robot unless you have a simulation without the incompleted robot. So the robot actually has to be completed with around five weeks or so to program. So programming would be a dependent task. Correct, and that also goes under the timeline as well. So you need to figure out what task to go after and before what. And does someone else raise their hand somewhere over there? In the back. I can't really hear. A Gantt chart. A chart, yes. So I actually don't know that many teams who Use, use Gantt chart. How many of you actually use a Gantt chart? Okay, so like about maybe one fifth of the room. Okay, what about other things that you use since we're on the subject? Yeah. An erasable calendar. <laughs> okay, we well, can always cross things out, right? I mean, I don't suggest it, but. Oh, it happens. Yes. Okay, so today I have two examples for you to just give you an overview of what Clayton and I believe project management is all about. So first example we are all very familiar with is bill season. So bill season in general is a very, very big project. And it involves a lot of meeting projects, but we will be talking about bill season in general as a big project. So a lot of good components that you all mentioned already. What we believe you first should do is definitely come up with an idea for your project, how you want it to look. So the scope, setting milestones, setting objectives. Um, so you want to, for your build season specifically, on the day of kickoff, you might not just want to start building your robot right away. You might want to start brainstorming about ideas, bring everyone together, and have a set objective for your build season in general first. Am I right? Is there any team who does different things than what I'm suggesting here. What? I'm pretty sure they brainstorm ideas too. They just do it a little bit quicker than us. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, okay, so then some teams, they will also perform a game, uh, a game analysis before they go into brainstorming ideas for their robot design to see what they want to focus on for the game. So these all fall under setting objectives and understanding what your project will look like. And then setting timeline is also very important. Um, then we go on to the plan. So we need to start planning it. So we have a general timeline, but then a lot of other things that we all mentioned here, who is going to do the task? Um, which task is going to depend on other tasks that need to be finished first? So these, are, these all fall under planning and how many people we have, how many resources we have, the budget, and then we need to start organizing it. 
Um, so, for example, we need to check up on them, and then uh, we also need to locate actual resources. So we might want to say, during the planning process, we plan on using aluminum for our robot. However, you might not know how much you have. So during the organizing process, the organizing stage, you want to actually check how much you have before you start doing anything. So if you have a fully catted robot, but you don't have enough resources and you don't, you're not able to get them anywhere, then you basically just waste that whole time designing something that is not achievable. Make sense so far? Okay, so then after that, we have this stage where we call it producing and monitoring. So for build season, it's a little bit abstract, but for smaller projects such as organizing a workshop, which we will talk about in a little bit, there's this producing stage where the event is actually happening so during that stage, you also have to go around and make sure everything is okay. And a real life example would be uh, the VA people just came here and checked to see if the mics are working, if I have a clicker. So that's producing and monitoring during an event. And then going back to build season, how you can do it is, like I said, build season is a big project, but it involves mini projects inside this big project. So some way that we can produce and monitor is Let's say during week three, your cat is supposed to be fully done, fully catted. So you can go back and ask the leads, is it done? Um, you can monitor them and see if they're on progress. If they're not, then you might want to talk to them and see, okay, why is it slowing down or why is it not done? So it's important to monitor that while you're organizing everything as well. So it's more like simultaneously going on process. Okay. All right, and then finally, after your project, um, it's very likely that you're going to have many different projects going on at the same time. However, after each one, it's very important to evaluate and reflect. So we often miss this step, because what we always focus on is, okay, that worked out great, so we're not gonna worry about it. Or that didn't work. Okay, let's just think of a new solution for it. But after we think of a new solution and it works, we just forget about the past and we didn't look back and see what failed. So it's really important to do that so we don't make the same mistake again. So evaluations and reflecting on what we did wrong or what went well. So we keep in mind for next event, for next project. So that's example number one. is a little bit broad, but because it's a really big project. <clears throat> okay, now we have Example number two is a smaller scale project um, and we have it on an intra-team training. So this requires someone planning workshops for let's say new members or even better members on the teams, uh, on, the, on, the, on your team. So going back to what I listed out for build season, first you need to brainstorm ideas and set objectives to see what your project wants to look like. Um, how many workshops do you want to have? What's your goal? Do you want the new members to learn the basic of some knowledge or do you want them to learn um, more advanced skills? Hands-on or just lecture style? So these all go under brainstorming ideas and just setting a scope of how your project is going to look like. And other things about uh, planning, inter-team trainings, it could also be organizing it. So finding leads who will be able to do it, finding rooms for the workshops, uh, finding a time slot that will work for most people, and then sending out an email. Definitely don't send it the day before because chances are your members are not going to see them and they already have other things planned. Um, how many of you here have experience planning a workshop for your team? Okay, is there anything that you want to share? Just so I'm not the only one talking. Sure. Okay, I'm gonna give it to him first. <laughs> yeah. For us, it was uh, difficult to find knowledgeable people mm -hmm. that actually want to give lectures about their knowledge because we had knowledgeable programmers, mm -hmm. but they didn't want to talk in front of a crowd. Okay. So finding someone which was both a good programmer and a good speaker was difficult for us when organizing our uh, mm -hmm. inter team trainings. Okay. Um, anyone else, or let me just make a slight comment on that. So, 
We will go over that in a little bit, but it's also important to have plans for that. So in case that happens, something that we could always look into is trying to contact someone outside from your team and see if they would be willing to offer help. A way we kind of combat the um, problem of formality and having someone do you know, a big formal speech is to have smaller training uh, kind of sessions within the subgroups where they can either you know, send the interested people videos to look at themselves as well and they just sit down and talk about the process rather than having to put them on the spot and prepare something you know, that's more difficult. So, that's kind of how we do it, and it seems to work. But it's just, uh, yeah, people organize when they want to meet and all that kind of stuff. Thank you. So it all comes back down to the planning process and the way that we organize it, and again, setting how you want your project to look like. So these three points are really important. And just a quick question. How many of you actually evaluate your projects that you've worked on? OK. So actually, not that many. Yeah. So it's a really difficult task to do because we often just move from project to project, like boom, boom, boom. OK, that one is done. Now focus on the other one. However, it is important. So how many of you actually have run into the same issues across different projects? Maybe. Yeah. So <laughs> that is why it's important to see to understand, uh, to evaluate. So one small and common example would be on your first project, you run into technical difficulties. If you don't evaluate on that, next time it's likely that you're going to run into the same problem again because you don't remember that you ran into technical difficulty on your first project. Yes? Definitely. So what I personally found very effective is that for each project, um, <coughs> you should have some sort of project proposal. So you document what your original objectives are and um, how you plan everything, what are some tasks that you've originally set for. And then after that, you do an evaluation so that everything is documented. So. Clayton and I actually both organized an FRC off-season event back in California. And what we do after each off-season event is that we will create a document asking all the leads to comment on things that they thought we could work on a little bit better or things that they thought it went really well so that we could continue next time. So something would be like, oh, the sound system wasn't working that well for this off-season event. So then we make notes of it, and then for the next one, we do better. Is that, does that make sense? And then we save it so that whoever will be in charge of this project next, they will know what to do. Yeah. One of the things that we try to do, and because I know all the teams are always trying to reach out and do more outreach to your potential and future STEM leaders, whether they're going to be on your team or otherwise, um, you get involved in a lot of things and maybe a lot of different types of trainings and what we've decided is just like what we've learned from building the robot, if you stick with a good thing and make it better, you tend to have more success than if you're always trying something new and different. So we have some signature things that we've been doing for a long time for outreachs that have been successful and by staying with those and just tweaking them to make them better. Uh, to maybe cover more territory or whatever, it has um, it has been something that people recognize us for, and then it's easy to pass that on to new members because we're not all all learning something new at the same time, and uh, uh, the team members get better at it, and the programs get better. So that takes a lot of stress out of some of those things. That is a very good point, and I'm pretty sure you don't need not to try new things. It's just try it at the right time. So if, let's say, your team is all new, you probably don't want to go for something also new so that you're all learning. So the point is, if you know something that works, stick to it until you know for sure that something new is also going to work. Okay. And then after we 
not really briefly, but briefly talked about these two examples. Um, this is the activity that we will play in. Something's in the way, but it's okay. So, this is a board game that Quinn and I created originally for our workshop that was presented at the um, NorCal workshop day. And uh, we will revisit this after the lecture is over. However, I do want to give you a brief overview of what this is and let you play with it a little bit. So, how this work is, um, for each of your table, you have about 10 people. So among these 10 people, you are going to divide up yourself into different roles on the team. And I would prefer you to choose a role that you are not currently in, or you have never been. So if you're alumni mentor, try to pick a role that is not a mentor or a student. So maybe be like, be like a parent, or like, okay, yeah, parents. Um, yeah, so here are some suggested roles that I can think of. Parents, lead mentors, new members, uh, team members, general team members, and then we also have officers. So these are some roles. And for each little box, after you divide up yourself into these different roles, and then for each of these boxes, we will roll a dice, and the number that you roll, I will have a scenario for you and you are going to talk about yourself, and then I'll randomly pick a table to share what you discuss, and then you will talk about yourself to see how, as your role, will um, behave or will take action in that certain scenario. So let's say today is a recruitment event. What would a mentor do? What would a new member do? Or um, what would an officer do? Uh, do? And keep in mind, this is project managing, so it involves more like, let's say, what if something happens? So what if it's an outdoor recruitment event, and then all of a sudden it rings? Um, so that was a really broad example, but my scenarios are a little bit more specific, so why don't we just take a little bit of time to divide up your roles? And remember that, because you will also be that for the end activity, and um, we will see and we will compare the differences in your response before and after this lecture to see if they change. Okay, so take like maybe one or two minutes to just talk about what role you want to be and remember that. Remember, be someone you know you're not already are. No, he can't be a new student. He's already been a new student. So... You could be a parent, be a parent volunteer. Parent. Oh, there you go. Parent volunteer. Okay. okay. What are you, Lori? I'll be the school leader. Oh, there you go. Uh, I guess I will be a new student. So you're both mentors? Yes. Okay. And uh, I was I'm a teacher, coach, so I'll be a. I'm. Ne I was never a first student, so I'll be a team member. Okay. Okay. All right, we're done. Now what? <laughs> mentors, parents, coaches, alumni, and students. So those are the possible roles. Okay, so we are right you are the Thank you. 
And then we will move to competitions, well, bag and tech first, because that's important. And then we will go to chance, which is where we are here today. And in each different little segment, there are different scenarios that correspond with that specific time period. So we roll the number two. What that means is that I will give you scenario number two. So the scenario is you are a month into preseason training. And then one day, you overheard two new members talking about how they don't feel like they're part of the team and they aren't being trained enough. What should you do? And try to stay in the same role. So if you're a lead mentor, what would you do if you overheard someone talking about that? If you're a Yeah. <laughs> 
No, we're good. Okay. Hands for you. So, something that he mentioned would be personal training. However, one thing to keep in mind is that some people actually might think that you're playing a little bit of favoritism here. So you have to be careful about that. Um, okay, so let's try another one. Okay, we're moving six steps ahead. So what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, we're on eight. So we actually passed the stage of kickoff. Now we're into build season. Oh, I know, fun. Okay, so this is a little more event specific scenario. So it is your team just recruited a new sponsor, a potential sponsor, and you need to present them with a little bit more information about your team and what you do. Um, they will be visiting your workshop, your lab, in a week. So keep in mind that you are during boat season. What is there to plan? Again, try to stay in your role. So if you're a mentor, what would you do in this situation? If you're a new member, is there anything you can contribute? If you're an officer, what would you do? Go ahead and talk about it. Also, when they're visiting, we want to make sure that we have a nice mix of students, not just like senior officers. We want to have like both newbies and like intermediate off people. Um, you may want to show older robots so that they can see like, oh, here's our finished products. Um, and we also want to show our new robot, like maybe show an operating carpet. It'd be like if we have a finished shooter, we can show them like, oh, 
it's a shooting thing, it shoots. Um, <laughs> and we may want to show them um, some of our other outreach programs. Like if mm -hmm. we have like, oh, we also do this other thing that is not robotics. And so show like how we're spreading STEM. Thank you. So hands for this table and for our designated speakers on this table. Um, and we actually okay, so they said they have a really good one. So I'm gonna let them go first and then I'll come back to you. Yeah. <laughs> Who's speaking? <laughs> Oh, okay, we have the same person. I'd just like to say she took my notes, so I'm going from that lady. So we decided that we would designate a tour guide, so that way we weren't really impeding on the rest of the group. Who does that? Her. What is her role? What's your role? Uh, a mentor. She's a mentor. And then uh, my father over here decided that he would uh, cater the event with food. Okay. okay, sounds great. So it definitely demo last year's robot. Okay, demo last year's robot. Um, so it definitely involved a little bit more planning than that, but yes. that's a good start. <laughs> Setting <laughs> objectives. So is there any that table, right? Okay. Oh, and there's one in the front. So let's go after this. Yes. So we kind of were thinking something similar uh, to have a tour. Uh, because everyone's working on build, we don't want to impede their work. Um, and we thought it would be a great opportunity to show a sponsor around the building and, and around the different subgroups to see what, what their, their money is doing. Mm -hmm. And we thought we'd, um, the mentors uh, and students would decide um, that we'd have a mentor, a lead, and a new student uh, tour around the donor so they can talk about their different perspectives so the parents can t uh, validate the students and what they're doing. Parents can do that as well and talk about their perspective and how they give back and then the students can give their own feedback as well. And of course before all that we make sure that the students and leads uh, know to be on the best behavior, maybe clean up their areas a little bit. Um, and yeah, we could also see if we could have a last year's robot running um, to do a demo. And then if parents wanted to get involved as well, maybe one of them could bring uh, food or refreshments. Yes. So the actual mentioned a really good point is that I specifically emphasize that this event will be happening during build season because very often you will get a group of your officers saying that no, we don't really want to have anyone else here because we want to just work on the robot, you know, busy putting it together. So, you know, sometimes when we are building the robot, we can be a little bit pushy on something. So that's a really good point to remember is to coordinate between officers, mentors, parents, and see if it's even possible to have this event for the next week. And um, there's definitely more planning involved in that, and we'll see what this table has. Um, we decided to have like a meeting with all the students and mentors to um, set priorities of what it is we wanted to present to the sponsor um, because they might be sponsoring a certain part of our robot. Uh, so we get like everyone to wear their team gear for that night. We have people who aren't doing anything clean. Um, we have the like older um, team members check on the newer team members, team members to see if they are okay with everything um, to make sure everyone's included. Inclusion is a big part, so definitely it's for them. Yay. Okay. Okay. So we all mentioned some really broad and simple planning for these scenarios. Um, there are definitely more detailed processes that go into these. So for example, how are you going to contact the students and the parents who will be there? Like I said, you don't want to send an email out or send a message out to them the night before and be like, hi, we need you here tomorrow and we need 30 sandwiches. That's not quite achievable, given if the parents are working. So these are all the planning that go into it. And like I said again, if the lead team would be okay with sponsors coming into the workshop and all of a sudden they have to pause everything to just talk to them. 
Um, you also need to find out, you know, sponsor availability time. Um, if they're coming here at like in, in the morning, in the afternoon. So these are all the things that we have to look at. Look, Clayton is here. I'm so glad you made it. <laughs> So that was some fight issues, so I will calm down, calm down, we have a lot of chat. <laughs> so I'll let him first introduce himself, and then <laughs> we will continue with the rest of our lecture, uh, lecture, since now you have a little bit of overview of how we are going to play our board game later on. text 
And it's important that you kind of come up with a way that you really like to communicate and kind of communicate that to other people too because you don't want to be like, I mean, a lot of people, everyone is like a separate platform. That's like one of the issues of today's digital fragmentation. But um, everyone is like a different platform. Really like, some people are really like using email. Some people really like using, you know, Facebook groups. You know, every team is kind of has its own different preference. And within each team, every person is like a different preference. And so, you know, kind of communicating what kind of channels you want to designate for your team, you know, kind of as like, okay, this is going to be our main mailing list, or this is going to be our main list. We like to say, you know, on 35 below, we have a Facebook group. It has all the parents, it has all the mentors, and all the students in it. And if we have anything that's kind of semi-important, we post it in there. If we have anything that's super important, it goes out via email, guaranteed. For 1678, it's basically all email. The Facebook group is just for, like, kind of fun side stuff. And so every team kind of has, like, a different um, balance of these things. And of course, you've got to check them regularly. And again, I'm talking a little bit more about how I kind of manage all these this systems personally. Um, and then we go into schedules. So, in the time of communication, one of the more important things that you want to communicate is definitely your schedule. So, say you know you're a lead and you're a driven lead, and you're doing like five APs alongside robotics, and also doing debate and other stuff. You know, or you're a really dedicated mentor, but you also work full time, and maybe you're also helping out with another hobby or a startup or something of that sort. You know, you want to make sure that the rest of the team knows the rest of the team knows these things so that you know they don't have an unrealistic expectation of your availability. You know, because then we can start getting these nasty things about like, oh I thought you know mentor X said they could be here for so and so and mentor X is like, no, I told you I had work, but you didn't. Or like, you know, or your lease only vanishes and it's like, wait, did I not tell you I had like four AP tests this week? So I think, you know, that's something to lay out, I think, from day one, you know, like, how much time can you realistically commit to robotics? Because, you know, as much as we like to think otherwise, there's a world outside of robotics. So, um, we do want to make sure that uh, you kind of, that everyone on the team also knows that. And, yeah, it's all the time management. And to-do list just is kind of a good way to keep track of your own tasks. I'll talk about that in the video when I have screenshots. And know your limits. So, delegation is a big thing, I know myself included, when I first started getting into leadership, I was like, I'm like super energetic and happy, I can do everything. And then I couldn't. Well, I kind of could because I had to, but that was a different story. Because um, that was a really small team, never mind. Um, but most of the time, you know, when you, your team, especially when your team grows to a sufficient size, you can't really say, I'm going to do everything on this team. And at some point, you're going to have to yield it to someone that can do it, you know, maybe 70 or 80 percent as well as you can, and I mean, that ties into not taking too many things and sleeping because most of you, I believe, are still human, I think, <laughs> I hope. Um, and I mean, of course, there's no, I know a lot of you leads, and especially a lot of you mentors who probably work in the industry, you know, a lot, of the thing, a lot of the stuff is probably second nature to you, but you also have to realize that as leadership and as mentors, you know, we need, this is knowledge that we kind of need to pass on to younger students do and kind of get them on the same page, um, you know, kind of passing on what we know, because it's one thing to kind of know instinctively what you're doing through your sort of experience, and it's another thing to be able to pull that back out and say, okay, if I wanted to tell someone what good self-management was, what would I say? And so this is kind of what the goal of some of, these are, some of our slides are, is kind of to pull those things out that a lot of us might, you know, know from doing leadership for a while. And so I guess the takeaway point is, you know, set your priorities straight, make sure that, doesn't, I mean, you're not obligated to set first as your top or even your third or fourth priority, but, you know, at least make sure that you communicate to everyone around you, leads, mentors, parents, you know, that, okay, this is about as much as I can do, this is when I'm available, this is the best way to communicate to me, and if you do those, that, if you, if you do those, then you can reach your success with you. If you can't reach them successfully and you do those, then we can talk about, you know, I violated, I slacked off, yada, yada, yada. But, you know, if you haven't set those expectations beforehand, then you can't really, you know, expect to be able to say that. And I will, oh wait, no, yeah, so you can start. Right. Still recovering. Okay, so, so personally, this is my system, and it's not really an unfortunate or anything, but I use Thunderbird. It's um, a male client that's cross-platform. Um, and there's others like it, you know, there's Outlook, 
um, and mail bird on Windows, there's Evolution and Gary on Linux, and there's like Apple Mail and other things on, on Mac OS X. But um, Thunderbird is kind of my central hub now for managing all my team communications. So I don't know if you can see, but you know, on the left here, I kind of have all of my emails connected to it. So I have like a personal email, I have my data school email, my Gmail for robotics, iCloud for media projects, and so on and so forth. Um, and you're probably wondering why does he have like 10 different emails? Well, um, besides something else I'll talk about, which is kind of separation and granularity, um, it's also kind of just, if one gets comp if one gets compromised, I can just cut that one off and move on with the rest. Um, but yeah, so, if you can look at the, I think, yeah, I control, I have the power. Um, so, as you can see, I've got an expanded few of these windows. So you can see underneath my Gmail, so my main robotics email, I have, you know, a robotics and theme folder, remember that's a separate folder for each of my teams, and within those are filters that are set up to basically grab every team mass mailing message that goes into those folders. There's a laser oh, really? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. There you go. Cool. Yeah, so, you know, I have one for Citrus Circuits, which is 678, Firebot 3501, I have one for, like, general first announcements and stuff. And then down here in my iCloud, I have like a whole bunch of other companies that make like music and audio software and video software um, that I buy from. But anyways, so I kind of like this system because this way you kind of have like this granularity to what you want to deal with. You know, say you you know that you know some important box event is coming up tomorrow, and you have something that you want to work on or watch, you can. You know, this allows me to just say, okay, I want to focus on my Gmail, and I want to focus on this, dealing with the stuff that's inside the 1678 folder, because 1678 is competing at chance or something, and it, my other teams aren't. You know, or I want to deal with, you know, Firebuck, because they're doing outreach demos tomorrow, and I think, you know, this kind of allows you to focus a little better on what you want to. I mean, it's, it's kind of really just kind of a mental way to kind of focus on what you want to work on at any given time. Really curious, how many of you have used something like this before? Uh, raise your hand. Hi. Okay, okay. That's good. So, yeah. If you don't use it, you might want to start looking into it. Um, before you go into a little bit deeper of what this is, is there any confusion of what we're talking about here? Yes, I can. So before we go on a little bit more about this, is there any confusion, especially those of you who don't use a mail server like this? Like, Similar outlook. Yeah, kind of, yeah. So I know there are people who did not raise their hands, so I'm wondering if you're still on the same page with us, what we're talking about. Question? No, we all know what this is. Okay. Great, that laughter was not very reassuring, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to make of that. Um, but anyways, so... Yeah, so, I mean, I think it just, you know, in a way it, it just really helps you focus on like certain things and you can kind of compartmentalize, you know, what kind of emails you want to deal with and where you send them from so you're not always kind of getting, you know, I used to have one email for everything and then I got like, you know, work emails, from my school emails into it, and then like mentor emails, and then just kind of became like this giant list of like a hundred emails, like which one do I start with? Yes? Um, can you have different emails in this uh, thing? Like, yeah, so all these big bold headers are separate emails. So like the Gmail is actually like the Gmail account, and then iCloud is only separate G iCloud account. So this is like a regular email account, except it kind of pulls it from all different servers and comes all these in one place. So in case you didn't hear the question, it was if you can have separate email accounts on this platform here. And yeah. Yeah, how do you manage this and social media at the same time? I will answer that because that's actually in the, uh, the next slide. I think. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so before I go into the social media, um, I also like Thunderbird personally because it has plugin support, and this is to-do list. You know, there's a lot of other to-do list apps like any.do, and there's Evernote and Google Keep and stuff, but to-do list I like for a number of reasons, including simplicity and cross-platform. But anyway, so it's good to also have like a kind of a to-do list, because I feel like um, I, for email, I kind of use as kind of a big overview of tasks 
running throughout every facet of my life. And with with the to-do list, I can kind of you know pull out the most urgent of those tasks that are due maybe today or tomorrow or in a week, and say this is the stuff I need to get done. I can arrange the right priority. I can get myself notifications. You know, I can assign like exact dates that I want to to tell myself that this is due. And with email, you don't have that kind of granular control. And there's a question. Well, just a comment. We found that students don't read email, so a group text messaging system like Remind is working way better for our team doing similar things than what you're doing. Okay, just to reiterate what he said, he said that his team found a group text messaging system worked better for his team because email didn't work out that well. And, I mean, just to go back to what we said, you know, figure out what works best for your team. There's always new platforms. There's like Slack and there's group text and you, know, you can always try different things. Every team try, kind of tries to do something different. So, uh, so email is kind of a macro view, to do list is kind of a very detailed view. And then we have that we're not gonna go back. I'm not gonna talk about it. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Um so the other thing I like about Thunderbird compared to some other things is that there's kind of you can have there's a plugin that adds like a built mini web browser. So I can attach all of my other web apps up there, so I have like my Facebook messages. I have like the Google Calendar, um, I'll talk about this one later. And I have another email system up there that's not directly linked to stuff. Uh, yeah, over here. So you can see that I have different tabs. So in addition to my, my uh, in addition to my main mail, mail tab, I also have my Google Calendar and my Facebook messages, which I didn't screenshot because of privacy reasons. But basically you can kind of have you know, these separate outlets also dialed into this one like window. Um, this thing right here is called Podio, or Podio, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's basically kind of a project management system in itself. Um, it's really flexible, and we mainly use it to coordinate workshop stuff because we can create web forms and get data from them. And you say, yes, but why not SurveyMonkey or Google Forms? Because SurveyMonkey and Google Forms do not have an API that I can pull other data from if I want to programmatically. Um, but really the only reason. But this is kind of, so, takeaway is, I kind of set up Thunderbird so that I can, you know, fire up one program and pull in all, like, my 10 emails and my social media and my workshops, sign up, and my calendar and my other email all at the same time and it will all sync into my eyes in, like, under a minute or under a couple seconds. So did that answer the question that someone talked about? Yeah. About that social media? About how do you manage social media? My answer is you just fold it into the rest of this giant stream of data. Yeah, okay. I was gonna say I don't think he's here right now. Push out. So this is all okay. under Thunderbird? This is all under Thunderbird, yeah. That's nice. Hmm? That's nice. Yeah, it is. There it is. It's also cross-platform, so I use it on Linux too. What about Mac? Well, so Mac, Mac actually works on Mac too. Yeah. So works on Mac too. Apple Mail does a similar thing. Outlook on Windows. And there's also a nice feature of watching graphs in life that you can move mail between accounts. So say you somehow end up getting a robotics email in your personal email, you can just move it to the robotics folder and put it out under there. And you can kind of treat them all as one like contiguous box if you want to that way too. Yeah, so I have a MacBook Air, and it definitely works on my MacBook, so it's confirmed that it works on Mac, it works on Windows. I'm not sure if it works on Linux, though. It so. certainly works on Linux because I run it online. So it works on Linux as well, so great platform to keep in mind. I'll leave a slight word of caution that Thunderbird's not super actively developed right now, so I mean, if that's a concern to you, I mean, it's still pretty stable as it is, but it's not super quickly updated. Okay, there's a question. Do you have to like download this to the computer or is this like an online thing entirely that you just open up? It is a downloadable program, which has a number of benefits, including being able to access your messages and archive them offline when you don't have an internet connection, um, which is kind of what I like about having an offline mail client too. Okay, yes? Is there an app for it? Yeah, I was going to go into that. Oh, the question was, is there an app for it? And the answer is, as usual, there is an app for it, indeed. Um, so I use an Android phone for various reasons, and this is MailDroid. Um, there's a number of other clients across uh, 
iPhone 2, I also have the full life from like deeper testing stuff. Um, you know, Apple Mail kind of is really is pretty good. There's also a whole bunch of, there's like way too many clients to name. There's like Dropbox's own thing that they phased out. There's like Cloud Magic, there's like Blue Mail, and a whole bunch of other things. But this is Android I use on Android because I found that a lot of the other solutions um, on mobile phones tend to try to simplify your mail a lot for you. So it's like, you know, they can turn into a chat stream or it can turn into swipe to delete or swipe to remind or something like that. Um, but they don't really allow the ability to really do anything more because they want to keep it simple, which is great if you want to keep it simple, not if you're a control freak like me. <laughs> um, so MailDroid allows me to do things like create a bunch of custom filters, a um, bunch of random like filtering rules, um, you know, set up multiple emails just like Thunderbird, move email between accounts, which Apple Mail also does, I believe, um, and create new subfolders, which is really the most important thing for me. Create new subfolders within your email account so you can kind of com com compartmentalize further you know, on the fly. And I don't have a super deep amount of familiarity with the equivalent for iOS. I know Apple Mail already does a handful of what I just described. I believe there are other things. There are definitely other things that I haven't really looked into. Is there anyone who uses iPhone yeah, and has like... Recommendations? Yeah. Or recommendations for other platforms? Like. Yeah, but there's someone trying to raise this hand here. I don't have an iPhone, but I've heard that the Outlook app for iOS is the best one available. That is it, what I've heard too, works. actually. It's interesting. <laughs> Very ironic, too. Um, Sounds like everyone should just use Android. How do you feel? Wow. Wow. We are like not, not sponsored by Google. Okay, sure, you might be, but mine aren't. Um, oh, no, Apple is awesome, too. <laughs> I, mean, I, I do have a memo here, so I can. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, so, so these are kind of, this is kind of like my really fine grain solution. And, Obviously, there's other ones that you might, you know, if you want a simpler system, there are other systems. There's like Boomerang, which is a plugin for Gmail um, that allows you to kind of schedule mail, sending at different times, and kind of, you know, drop reminders in your inbox when they're sent and stuff like that, uh, which is really cool. It's kind of automated. Uh, Boomerang, like the object? Boomerang, yeah. One of my commenters uses it to schedule her emails ahead of time, so she doesn't have to like keep track of it because she's always busy with work. Um, and there's also things like Gmail or Google's own inbox, which is like their successor, well, it's supposed to be successor to Gmail, which kind of has more intelligent filtering algorithms and tries to like figure out what emails are more, or should be prioritized more to you. Um, there's a couple, does anyone give any other suggestions for this? Those are the few I can think of on top of my head. But I mean, as I said, there, if you run the search for mail app in like the App Store or Play Store, there's like a dozen of these things, and they're all like, we make emails simpler, and there's, you know, there's a couple of cool features in those, but, you know, if you want kind of like this really granular control, I think it's kind of hard to beat this kind of system. Yeah. How much does it cost? Cost to do what? To get this, does it cost this? to download this program? Droid is free unless you want the new wide version, so yeah, that's... There's no other version that you can buy, but you can get all the sales over free. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh, twice in the last few years, I have had a total crash on my computer, and um, I was able to recover some contact from some email, but no folders. So, does anybody have some good advice for how you can say? Oh yeah, I, I'm, because I do organize like you do in some way, but the folders, I'm not figuring out how to be able to keep that. Well, the folders should be stored on the, I think this is something to like go into detail later one on one, but I think the folders should be stored in the company server, so they shouldn't be lost if your computer crashes. So, so I subscribe to Office 365, okay. so will the folders save in the cloud? They yeah. should. I don't have a lot of familiar with that system, so. I believe they should sync. Like, they're supposed yeah. to. They're supposed to. Oh, speaking of subscriptions, there's also a new feature of Thunderbird that you can subscribe to RSS feeds if you're into that kind of thing. So, like, if you 
you can pull like RSS feeds. I think you can still pull them from like Twitter and Tumblr and other stuff too. You know, like have like all your news in one place. I used to have that too, and then it got too overwhelming. Um, yes, information overload is still a thing with this kind of thing. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so before we move on, yeah, if there was a hand that went up and down. Yes, yes you. you. Oh, I'm kind of right there. Yes, you. In the white shirt. Can we access this information about Thunderbird and those scenarios online, or? I'm not sure what first policy is on releasing these afterwards. I suppose they will. They haven't asked us for a slide, so I assume that they I will. Mean, I feel like we could personally send them out to it. We could, but we don't have all the emails, and yada, 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 and sending a mass email to like 200 people is a spam filter for that thing. Anyways. But yeah, no, we could definitely get the information to you if you want it. Maybe post it and send out maybe a um, shortened URL, or at least create a shortened URL. Well, the yeah, we, we could work with first to see what we can yeah. do, and then... I think first we'll probably... I believe they're recording. They are recording. Mm -hmm. so, so you'll you'll kind of have these slides to view the video form. I don't know if you're going to get them in PowerPoint form. I mean, if you, if you really want to... A little bit after yeah, and then talk to just, us. Yeah, email to you directly. Anyway, so anyone, any last questions on managing yourself and or maybe your own opinions on like what's worked best for you as a lead or a mentor before we move on? Alright, so now we will be talking about how to manage your team and I'm assuming most of you are FRC team, so I'll focus on FRC in general. And the reason why we talked about managing yourself before managing your team, because if yourself is not organized, it's up. if yourself is not organized, then you would not be able to organize a team. And you wouldn't be able to get other people, other members, your lead mentors, to trust that you will also be organized for your team. <laughs> so first up, we have tasks. When we talk about tasks, often people think about, oh, I just need to delegate tasks or I just need to assign a task, and that will be it. <coughs> Simple, right? Not quite. So there are a lot of components that go into delegating tasks. So first of all, when you assign a specific task, you don't want it to be too broad. So if I just give a task to you and say, oh yeah, finish this. And if this is for a new member, chances are he or she probably has no idea what to do. So when you're assigning a specific task, only you have the picture in your mind of what you want it to be, what the outcome is like. So you have to convey that message very clearly to the person you're delegating that task to. Okay. And after that, you don't want to worry too much about it. So we've all heard of the term micromanaging. Yes? Do we like it? No. Okay. Yes. So when we're delegating tasks, just put yourself in their shoes. If you worry a lot about it and you constantly check on them and telling them what to do, then it's pretty much not them. Who are, they're not the one who are doing this specific task. You're the one doing it for them and they're just kind of just there. So you shouldn't worry too much. If, you're, if you have enough trust to delegate that specific assignment to them, you trust them and show them that you trust them so then they can be confident while they're doing that. And again, don't overdrive it. So you can be specific, as specific as you want, but definitely don't overstep that line. So make sure you communicate with them and set that expectations. You know, okay, I want you to do this and that, but I will step in if there is an emergency. Or just set a really clear line, okay, here is what you will be doing, and here is what I will be doing. Okay, so that line needs to be clear so that there wouldn't be any conflict later on. Um, okay, and then, like I said before, when you're being specific, especially for new members, they also need guidance. So, yes, you're not micromanaging, but you need to regularly check up on them. If they're doing fine, if they run into any problems, because a lot of time, we are very afraid to seek out help. So we can be assigned a task, but we're not, we, we are really scared to just ask for help and show them that we don't know what we're doing. So you have to take the initiative to ask them, hey, is everything going okay? Do you need help? 
let me know if you have any questions, and just in case you need some experience, here's what I've been doing it. So something like that, just to help them out. Um, and then motivation is important. So if you, as a leader yourself, you're not passionate and motivated, then how can we expect whoever we're delegating the task to, that person, to be motivated to do it as well, right? Okay. And then, um, so, what else do we have here? Okay. So then, last point for me to talk about for tech is that you might want to, at the beginning of this stage, in project management, you don't want to just start with having like 80 people doing something. You want to start with a smaller group and then gradually expand it. So, um, do we have any rookie teams here, maybe? Semi-rookie teams? Okay, yeah. So if you're a rookie team, you might not want to focus on recruiting like 50 members. You might want to focus on just setting your basic, your setting a foundation so that you have a solid background of what you want to do and how to do it instead of just expand it all and then no one knows what they're, oh, no one knows what they're doing. Any question about task, delegating task, or any experiences that you want to share? How do you manage delegation of tasks? Who's got them? Right, so that will, I will actually talk about that under people and team structure. I can actually go over that right now. I'm just gonna swap communication people and team structure since it goes right into it. So how, the question was, in case you didn't hear, how do we know how to delegate tasks to which person? So know your team and your team structure. Who are the decision makers? What people are good at? So one strategy that I like to do it is really get to know the members personally, what they're good at, what their personality is like. So if you know someone who already is super busy with their schoolwork, you might not want to give them a big task that requires a lot of time commitment. You, if they, you can, they can still feel involved if you give them something to do. So you have to understand their schedule, um, and then there's also personality. So if you know there are two people on the team who don't really get along, you might not want to set them <laughs> together for a task that requires close partnerships. You can work on that gradually, but definitely not right away and dive straight into it and be like, hey, here's a task, finish it together. Um, and then you also need to know their limits. So if, going back to new member, if that one specific new member, he or she has a solid background on catting, However, they have never catted a robot before, so that's their limit, so you might want a veteran member to guide them through it, but you can still assign the task to them. And um, on the same page of limits, you also sometimes want to push them out of their little comfort zone if you're a lead mentor or a mentor in general. So you really have to understand your team members personally, on a personal level, and see, and really understand who they are before you delegate a task. I hope that somewhat answered your question. No, not actually. Okay. Is there like a specific? Yeah. So I've assigned fifty tasks to fifty. I've assigned fifty tasks to fifty students. Mm -hmm. How do I keep track of who I've assigned what to and make them accountable for what I've assigned to them? Okay. So what I would say is have a little tier question. system. Because if you're assigning a task to fifty people, chances are you probably are gonna lose track of 50 different individual tasks. So what you wanna do is identify several leads, and then you delegate uh, different, so you delegate different tasks to these leads, and then have them delegate them to other people. So then they will keep track of those, and then you will just have to ask them, hey, how is it going? And one way to keep track of all that is, I like to keep it in a document. So I list out all the tasks that I've assigned, and then I list out who is in charge of what, and I also put down a due date next to it and a status right next to it. So create a, like a little table, um, and then there's a question comment there. Yeah, so I have a comment. Um, uh, my dad works for a company where he has this problem. He, he, the company constructs equipment, so keeping track of who does what is a really big problem. Uh, so his whole company just shifted over to an application called Asana, and uh, there's also another application like it that's free. I don't know, I'm looking into Asana right now, but Slack. 
So Asana and Slack, if there are applications where it really is designed for project management. Um, I know for Asana that the shop is set up so there are like TVs or monitors set up on the walls so employees can just look up and see their name and their task for the day and when they complete it, they go to the boss and they take it off the screen. So it's really effective and it's, it's very social so it alerts people by email and text messaging and so yeah, so that's really good for project management. Thank you. Yeah, and I know there are other programs similar to that. Um, many of you have probably heard of something called like Trello, uh, or tre Trello, yeah. Really good. Yeah, so that's a pretty good one. Um, but like I said again, you definitely want to know your team if your team is not someone who would go on Trello every day and cross out tasks. You probably want to find a better alternative for it. Okay. Uh, sorry, just if I can interject a little. So, I mean, the software model does work, I guess, fairly well for some people. Um, but I find that sometimes, especially with newer members, you know, like with freshman sophomores, they don't necessarily have the habit of checking their digital media. That's not like their social media, but like other forms of media, even like email and stuff regularly. And at least in my teams, I've kind of had. The, the fortune of working with kind of smaller groups. So like last year, 35 One's PR team was like three people. Last year, Sushin Sunday's business media team was also like two people with a couple orbiting satellites. Um, and so, and so with that, I think it's you know part of pays to be kind of observant and to also kind of have know who your anchor points are. That also talk to the other people that you want to keep track of if you want to approach this in kind of a more social, organic way, I guess. A question, question and then you. Just to build up to that, we use uh, Remind. If anybody's heard of that one? Yeah. Um, it used to be called Remind 101, but now it's just called Remind. You can Google it, it's pretty simple. And it's basically a, a middleman, so we would send out a message, the kids all get e uh, text messages, so it could be something that the kids to have trouble checking their because I know a couple of my younger members don't check their email a lot. Um, you just send an email out, like a text, basically, check your emails or for competitions, well, you set up a remind just for competition so that you send that, all right, we have a match in 10 minutes. Um, and it, like I said, it's, a, it's not just an email. It can be you know, associated with your email also, but the kids basically send, you know, they just text the number, add whatever, and then they're linked directly to the remind page, and then that gives them a text instead of an email. And obviously, high school kids are always checking that text message. So it, it's a direct link, and they can't miss it. You just have to get everybody to sign up for it, which is pretty simple. At our one of our, you know, one of the first meetings that we have out of the season, like in preseason, everybody take your phone out, text this number, and this, and then everybody signs up for it like instantaneously. So it's a nice, uh, neat thing. Thank you. No, thanks. Just a, a quick comment. When we started the meeting, about a fifth of the groups here use a Gantt chart approach to managing. Um, I just want to put a vote in for Gantt charts because a problem like this, sometimes it's related to people understanding what their impact is on the, the whole process. And a Gantt chart lays out responsibility. You can lay it out in enough detail where you can lay out their interaction on a critical path of tasks that need to be done for the entire group. Now clearly it takes a lot of effort to keep it up to date. but. But it does come from a, it is designed to come from a team concept. So you can you can put budget information in your Gantt chart so you understand individual pro, sub project costs down to individual responsibilities all along a timeline that shoots for the completion of a, a total project. So I think it I my my thought is is that it keeps in philosophy, it keeps it's aligned with the philosophy of the first process which is a team-oriented approach and a broad understanding of your role on the team. So. Thank you. All right, so those are pretty good comments, and I hope you all took notes of those, because the remind I definitely did not know, and it's a pretty good idea. It's pretty awesome. yeah. yeah, it sounds, it sounds pretty awesome. Yeah, thanks yeah. all the other leads and mentors for yeah, contributing your experience. And then, um, so finally, we're going back to communication, which we have been talking about a lot here today. So like Jaden has mentioned, when we first start the season, you really want to know what everyone's availability is and their preferred communication channel is. So like we all know, some younger generation doesn't really like to check their emails. 
So then you have to set the expectations for them. Okay, so we will send out an email every week. It contains important information, and if you don't read it, then you have to come to the meeting, which we will basically say the same information. So that's one way to do it. Or we can set up another server like the text message, so we communicate with them saying that, okay, so if there's a reminder, you will receive a text message, so be sure to check that. And you have to just make sure your team members know with, uh, which channel they're using for which information. So sometimes I know officers, they have their own Facebook group or Facebook group chat. So we have to make sure all officers know that and then maybe set up like a separate email for sponsors and parents. So we have to make sure all these communications are correct. And then we have meetings. So meetings, we all have meetings for our teams. So how do we have a good meeting so that all the messages are conveyed properly and that members know what they are learning and what they are um, getting to know about. So first, it's important to have an agenda. So kind of like the overview that we did before everything today, um, it's important to let them know what you will be talking about so then they can just take notes and be like, okay, I have a question for this or I have something to add during this section, so I have to pay extra attention during that section. Um, and then it's also important to set clear objective and stay on topic. So it's easy to just go off topic and talk about something else, especially if it's something really interesting. Um, so keep in mind, you have a set time, so like, you know, this workshop is 8.30 to 10.30. If we're about time, then we definitely don't want to go off topic and talk about something else. So keep in mind that as well. Um, and then we should also verbally summarize what we talked about in a meeting with everyone, just so that everyone knows what's going on. And in case someone spaces out, we still know what happened, uh, what happened in the meeting. Um, so like what we've been doing, we have a little point in red here, the takeaway, so that it's, it, it's like a mini recap of what it is. And specifically for managing your team, is really about setting expectations and letting everyone know that what they will be doing and how they should be doing it. Okay, is there any questions so far? Okay. So, so far we've been talking a lot about the project manager and like how they manage themselves and the team. But what about like the team members themselves? Like, how should they be involved in project management, and what do you do when like they are trying to influence the project management, or they like choose to do their own tasks, go do their own thing, or like, <coughs> those sorts of issues that often come up with project management systems? Do you want to? Katie, do you want to take that or? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's a really good question, and in case someone didn't hear it, is how do team members, general team members, get involved in project management and really just learn more about it and stay on task. So what I would say is it's definitely about the team members' personal initiative if they would like to take their first step. But again, back to leadership is we also have to recognize the times when we notice that some team members really want to get involved, but they're just not taking that extra step. So we need to personally reach out to them. But um, so since he specifically asked about what team members should do, I think they should really just take the step and ask for it. So very often there is this weekly email or some sort of meeting that will be talking about upcoming events. So team members, what you can do is Go up to an officer and ask for an opportunity. I would like to get involved a little bit more on the team. Can I help you organize this event? Or at least start participating in it so you know the general flow of the events or that specific project. And come. Um, so I hope you answered part of your question, but I think I also heard the other half was like, what if team members want to do their own thing and don't listen to what you delegate to them? Was that, did I also hear that? I think I heard that part of the question. So I hope this is a relevant example, but last year on one of my teams, we kind of had this issue where it seemed like we were handing people tasks and they kept vaporizing. 
Um, yeah, <laughs> it was kind of a, you know, and this was like our computer. So it was really small, as I said, and so it's easy to kind of find, talk to each other individually and find out. And it turned out that a lot of why things didn't get done was that the person we were handling to just didn't have great management and didn't really have the experience to follow through with some of these things. And I guess she was also too shy to ask or something. And so if you can kind of find out what everyone's individual reason is for not wanting to do something, you can find you something to address it. Now this year we had a different issue where someone didn't do stuff because it turned out that he actually had a simmering resentment toward our team. And that was a completely different ball game to play. Um, that one obviously was not quite as easily resolvable, but you know, I think it just goes back to finding out why they may not want to do these tests besides being rebellious high schoolers. <laughs> um, finding out why they might, might not want to do these tasks. You know, there's something you can help them with, or is there some deeper component to like, oh, my parents want me out of robotics, or do you want school stuff? And you can kind of you know, evaluate what you, as a lead or manager or mentor, want to do from there. Does that answer the entire question? Yeah, and just a little bit more to add on that is that's why I mentioned that regular checkups are really important. So what you want to do is set a soft deadline in your own mind and then have an actual hard deadline for them. So when the time for the soft deadline comes upon, you check on them and see if they finish the progress that you desire to see. If they not, uh, if, they're, if they're not, then you know that there's something going on and you might want to just check with them, check in with them to see if everything is all right. Sometimes it could be something that is totally out of their control, so like family emergency, and they might just be too shy or they just don't want to talk about personal problems. So sometimes as lead mentors or mentors or even just fellow team members, you need to reach out to them and see what they have to say about it. Any other questions before we move on? So another problem we have, similar to what they, so a, a member will not do what we ask them to do because they have a burning interest to do something else that seems very productive to them, but is not forwarding the team's overall vision. They want to go in a different direction, not that it's a bad direction, but it's not a good for the team direction. Okay, yeah, so, like I said, personally, I would suggest definitely, first thing to do is not to assume anything. So talk to them to see what their interests are. Because sometimes we see that their interests are these few areas, but chances are, you know, they might be interested in something totally different than we're thinking of. So then after you find out what they're really interested in, then we try to find a compromise. So give them something that they like to do. However, um, at the same time, also benefit the team and progress the team forward a little bit more. So it's really about finding that compromising area so that they're not just doing something that they like but not really useful or contributing much to the team or they're not forced to do something that we want them to do and they don't really like at all. Anything to add on? Yeah, I guess I'm kind of torn on answering that because as a student I was kind of that person, you know? I was like, yeah, this seems really cool and you know, the media stuff was, I was like, oh, this is really cool and also that no one else on the team was doing it so I'm just going to do it and eventually kind of grew into its own thing. And it kind of, I kind of validated its use to the mentors through all the stuff I did. And so I think from that perspective, keep an open mind. Now from a mentor perspective, I know, you know, there's kind of this build season, you have resources that are limited, you know, you don't want trains. And I think it's just going to have to be kind of finding a middle ground between just kind of getting creative, but like, or can we redirect that energy to something that might be productive, you know, for the team and for that student, you know, is there something that underlying what they're doing that they might find enjoyable, you know, that might, will also help the team. And then maybe you can point them into resources where they can expend their interests, you know, in other ways, like, I don't know, summer camps or like hobbyist programs and stuff like that, you know. So I think you can kind of develop it further in that direction because, I mean, the ultimate goal of first is kind of, well, one of the first kind of is to, to get kids involved in the step, right? So, you know, if, they really have a burning passion to go elsewhere, then you know, maybe you can point them elsewhere and maybe they'll think the team is not for them. Maybe that's okay. Maybe they'll still be inspired to pursue step. That's not necessarily a bad thing. And we hope that that's the answer you're looking for. Okay. 
so moving on, Sam will talk a little bit about how oh, yeah. events. Events are best. Okay, sorry, I gotta break up my weird voice. Um, so events are kind of a synthesis in some ways. So events, I mean, we mean things like workshops, off seasons, sponsor demos, basically anything that you do is that's not. I mean, it can be robot related, but we're talking about stuff that's kind of outside just building the robot. Um, and so with events, again, defining clear goals, you know, making sure that you kind of have, especially with events, because they're so short term and there's not really, then they kind of just happen in a day or two, more or less, usually, you know, especially with workshop and all season, it's like a one or two day thing. So you kind of really have to keep like a clear goal uh, <coughs> in mind and realize that you are probably one of the few people that has like this overall picture of how the entire event is going to go. Um, so like, Novi and I are coordinating off season right now. We've kind of already started, um, you know, having all these spreadsheets of like, what do you want to do for a budget? What do you want to do? How many teams do we want? You know, do we need to coordinate to facility hosts for food and for other stuff? And you know, we're kind of managing this event, so we have all that in mind. But when we re when we recruit other leads, say a publicity lead to help us, you know publicize or like a volunteer coordinator to help us find other volunteers to, to staff the event. You know, we don't necessarily pass them all the information. We kind of keep that in mind for ourselves just to not overwhelm everyone and just not, to not cross too many wires. But you kind of have to realize, you know, sometimes that you have, you need a clear goal and that you need to maintain that clear goal because not everyone's going to have that in mind. And yeah, I think that's what that does. Okay, resources. So, with any event, you definitely want resources. Uh, um, that's most often going to be things like location, budget, and transportation. Um, so, with transportation, especially because everyone and almost everyone in the first part, all the students by definition are high schoolers. Most of them can't drive, most of them are minors. Um, so, you're going to have to coordinate things accordingly. Like, for example, in 351, a couple weeks ago, we had this idea to make spontaneously go make alliance gifts and stuff. And um, the students had to go to another mentor's lab that was in a different part, that was not on campus, that was not in the normal robotics lab. And so right then and there, they all called their parents and then they had that mentor like talk to the parent and say, okay, are you okay with me driving this your student to, your child to this place, they'll be back by yada yada yada. And just kind of have that assurance because you know, you want to have to keep everyone in the loop on that one, especially when you're whisking them away on someone else's car. And then quick thing to add to that is that I don't know about other school districts, but I know my own old high school district, uh, for each adult driving minors or driving students, they have to sign some of some sort of packet and they have to submit some car insurance or something like that to validate that okay, yeah, we're safe to drive these students. So just keep in mind that there are some legal paperwork, or chances are there might be some legal paperwork that adults have to fill out when they transport students. So these are things that go into planning, and it might be a little bit difficult to solve at the last minutes. Okay, so with resources, transportation, you can't keep a budget, and kind of fundraising and stuff is kind of beyond the scope of this current workshop. Um, but do you want to keep make sure that if there was a budget consideration, say you're you know, you're running off season, and you have certain expenses to cover like food and um, well not so electricity, but like no oh, and like you know buying game elements and stuff. You want to keep kind of have that all delineated so that you're not putting yourself into the red after you run your event. Um, with duration and time, so I guess the best way to illustrate this is so 35 on demo. Uh, usually demos at Maker Fair, and I don't know, I think most people might have heard of Maker Fair. It's kind of like a little DIY exhibition, with a, not an exhibition, but kind of a community of like makers and DIY people get together and show off cool things. So um, when we demoed there last year, we kind of have this time slot, actually most of our outreach events, we have like this time slot system where we kind of delegate specifically like, you know, these two students are going to be staffing the booth at this time. But in the afternoon, they'll swap off with these other two students, and there's going to be a little, usually a little overlap to make sure that, you know, there's just students can kind of, there's to compensate if the students get late or something, or arrive late or something. But just, that's what we mean by, you know, duration of time, kind of keeping in mind, like, this is the full time of the event, and we can't expect necessarily everyone to be there, and so, you know, when can certain students or certain, certain mentors be there? Like, 16, 70, you know, we have people trying to, 
we need people to cover the lab, supervise the lab additionally sometimes. And so we just sent an email saying, you know, um, mentors, we need like this, the lab cover from like five to seven, can you make it from five to six? Or can someone else make it from six to seven and so on and so forth. Alternate plans, yes. Um, so, other accommodations, yes. So, um, you do want to check for weather, and those of you in other areas may not find this so strange, but we're from California, so rain is like a really special thing that we have to prepare for um, all the time, because it's like, oh my god, it's raining, where's the tarp? We don't even need tarp, it's California. Um, but, uh, so, but I mean, it's just kind of, you know, and also it's kind of the, the reverse, you know, can our robot stand being in the hot sun having his robo reel cooked for like several hours for the sake of our outreach event. <laughs> um, so just things like that and kind of uh, checking, you know, making sure that you kind of have a backup plan for if something spontaneously happens um, in terms of weather and stuff. Uh, okay. Yes. Finish what I was going to say. Yeah, okay. So, confirming with others, going back to what we said about just making sure you have people there. And if people come, and if people are not actually there, you know, if, you know, everyone has something going on. Maybe like like a last minute thing, like I didn't tell my parents, or you know, I realized I had a test, or like some family issue came up. You know, it could be all sorts of things. You know, make sure make sure that you have kind of a backup student or mentor to staff that area um, for. Demos, I mean, it is important, but you can probably have get away with like one person there, but with other events, you, um, like, say, off seasons, you definitely want to have like a fail safe of like, what if our volunteer coordinator goes missing on the day of? You kind of want to have someone that can just step in and kind of take care of it. It doesn't have to be a separate person. Um, if that happened to us, it'd probably be me and Nokia stepping in, but um, just to kind of make sure that there's someone else qualified there to handle making your event run smoothly because. <clears throat> I think the best run, you don't notice well-run events are well-run, but you only notice things when they break down. So, um, so make sure that you have a backup and that to everyone else it runs smoothly. Yeah. Yeah, and then I was just going to add to the weather thing. So it's not like just demos and all that. So even for regionals and championship, um, forecast is that St. Louis will rain. So you have to think about, okay, so if let's say we have to transport the robot from load in area to the venue. There is this pathway that is not covered with any roof or any covering. So what do we do just in case it rains? So we need to think about all of that. And then Go back. Yeah. Okay, and then finally, after you've made sure that everything is great on your side of the event, then you have to first start promoting it to others. And again, that's there's other workshops for that, but um, in terms of promotion, you know, it's good at making sure everyone is on board. So making sure that everyone actually knows that you're promoting the event, making sure that all your team is also as enthusiastic about the event as you are, because that's not necessarily always true. Um, some of them kind of just feel obligated to help. Some of them are obligated to help by definition of like club carbon and stuff. So, you know, kind of just making sure that, you know, when they're out there representing your team to other people, running your event that, you know, they're not, like, representing you poorly. Um, sponsorships is, is something to talk about else, otherwise, I think. So I think there's, just kind of sum up all of this, most of the events thing, but also kind of the rest of it, there's, I guess there's two points that I really wanted to talk about, which is, one, I think, you know, the, the best plans are going to be, the best plans are, infinitely scalable. So what I mean by that is when Nogi and I started this presentation, we wrote it for about 40 people or so, and then we presented it once um, at our kind of our local workshops to like 20 people. And then we came here and then there's like 200 people. And it still worked. Well, we had to make some tweaks, so it wasn't 100% solid, but um, the point is, I think making sure that your plan can happen with you know a, a lot more than you expect or a lot less than you expect it is really important you know especially for outreach events like this you know if, if like something happens that you lose five students can you still get away with doing it with 
just the other half of those students. Um, or if you know, you're know you preparing to demo to a crowd and you only think you're going to get 30 people and you get like 500 or not, that's kind of maybe over the top, maybe you know, 100 or maybe 90. You know, can your student skills handle that and not be like intimidated by, like, I didn't expect this many people. You know, so kind of preparing and kind of looking into each aspect of your plan to be like, can those resources, you know, can, can you find something to compensate for those resources if they don't turn out exactly the way you expect? So that's what I mean by having an infinite scalable plan. And the other thing I think is something I live by personally is um, you don't, it's not, I think the test of how effective you are as a project manager is not how effectively you plan in the first place, but how you react when things blow up in your face. <laughs> um, and I mean, honestly, because things you know, always do go wrong despite our best intentions, and it's just, you know, there's just too many factors to consider, and you can't account for everything. And so I think it's, it's important to, you know, kind of keep your clear goals there and kind of keep your mind clear because, you know, Especially if you're like a lead mentor, you know, I, a lead mentor or like just a lead in general, I feel like if, you know, if you start panicking, the rest of the team will, and will panic too because they know even less than you. And if you're panicking with all your power and knowledge, they will also fail for you in your panic. <laughs> so I think it's really important that you kind of, you know, keep yourself centered in the midst of like a bunch of uh, random or a bunch of unexpected occurrences happening like me missing my flight. Um, because the stability of your team might actually rely on it. Okay. So that's just closing that scalability, scalability, okay. and you know, the question is, okay. and question that time. wraps up our electric part. And I just want to know if the part. shrimp were worth it. <laughs> All right. Was the trip worth it? Was the trip worth it? Uh, yeah, so far. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so um, that concludes our lecture portion of this presentation. And for the remaining time, which is about 10 minutes, we can go back to the game and activity. So I know some people had to go. So if you want to stay and finish the activity, you can. And just try to fill out the table again so that we can divide up the roles again. Oh, but I know it's champs and we're all busy.